dar continuidade aqui à nossa conferência WebBR. E para dar continuidade aqui, essa daqui vai ser uma sala para workshop. Well, this workshop. is a room for workshop, performance renderization in the web. Sergio Lopes is a instructor and developer, and today he focuses in front change and performance web. He is a speaker at several talks, and he is a web mobile. Thanks for being here once again. Thank you. Well, you have to hear me for two hours. Once I was invited to speak at WebBR with half an hour slot, not anymore. Now we have like two hours. I will not talk for two hours nonstop, I promise you. I will just address a few things, then I will open for your questions and so on. E cortou o som aqui na cabine. Ah, voltou. <laughs> Here you find my Twitter and my blog. I have some published books. I like so much the frontline thing, so I feel at home. I have been working with them for 13 years, and I like so much the performance issue. Reinaldo invited me to talk about that. And the first talk I gave, ab I gave about performance was back in 2011. Not much was spoken about that in Brazil. And we would say, ah, do not forget to do the CSS file. Then we have to redimension that in the Photoshop. It's very nice to follow that. Once uh, the market of performance optimization, they developed uh, throughout time. When we think about performance, we think much about the classic performance style. How long does it take for my page to be uploaded? But even that's quite hard. What does that necessarily mean? How long does it take for a page to be uploaded? What is that exactly? Just part of the page, partially, fully? show everything to the user, what's that exactly? But it's not all. In addition to have the upload performance, there are some other interfaces. In the past, much was said about how long does it take to upload my website and so on. But there are some other interfaces. And this is exactly the motivation we got. Wonderful. To upload the page, this is one of the aspects, faster upload. And the past was so hard. All of that has to do with time, upload time. But I'm not here today to talk about that. I'm here to talk about renderization in the web or something like that, right? It's not just enough to have my website uploading fast if it takes longer to be executed. You have some websites that you upload, but you know, things uh, do not work fine. And then you scroll down and you feel the page getting locked. Or you click on a button and the interaction, interaction performance uh, the site has been uploaded, but then it takes ages to process that click. So you're talking about performance, interactivity, 
and I want to have a fast response. And response to time means if that page is fast or not. And that has much more to do than just uploading. Animation performance, have you ever seen any website which is kind of slow animation? It's locked. And when you open the menu, the menu is animated. It works fine, but you feel that there is something wrong about that. There is nothing wrong about upload. Does it make sense at all? There are other techniques in place. And some other performance aspects. We could be discussing performance from a memory standpoint. The heavier my page is, more memory it will be consumed. With devices with less memory, maybe my page is not able to execute it because there is not enough memory. Some other aspects, like a battery. What's the purpose to have a fast website, but if they consume too much batteries? And then it drains off the whole battery. Several different aspects in addition to that. Let me focus on execution, interaction, animation. What to do to renderize the things in the screen. And if you are not good at that, you may get into some possible bottlenecks and you have the feeling that your page is not responding, like the scroll down, the click animation, things that are not happening as they should. There are two aspects that they have. They represent a problem. So don't worry. So the topic of this uh, session addresses two things. If you have a main busy main thread, you will understand that in a while, I'm sorry. And when you have uh, too many paint layouts happening, you have to understand what it means, a paint and a layout. But these are the two bottlenecks that represent a problem. Shall we start from the very beginning? What's main thread? Main means main, right? And thread, you have a execution line. The idea is to have a program to execute one thing at a time. When the first browsers Years and years ago, JavaScript following that. Dual core, uh, quad core machines, they were not uh, fashionable as they are nowadays. There was just one single processor. So it was quite natural to them to design an environment that would apply that only processor that the machine has. What's that exactly? Anything that you execute in your browsers. Users type address, the address enters, then I have to download HTML. I have to read through all HTML tags. If there is CSS, CSS I'll have to download it bind it to HTML to create, to find each one of the elements. Or browsers that were set up with those HTML. I can also have some JavaScript 
to be run, or maybe you click on a button that will trigger to a JavaScript event that will run in that machine. Before all of that was executed in one single thread. In the past, of course. This is what we call main threads. Navigator has the main thread, which executes HTML, JavaScript, estimates the page layout. When you have like reading 50%, that has to be calculated. We have to understand size, calculate, understand number of pixels. Such a process when you translate what has been written, the CSS, this is the so-called layout. And main thread is responsible to execute all these steps. Who are those who are experts on competitors, development, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Today, any regular cell phone comes with eight cores. If you have eight cores in your device, what's that good for? Not for much. Why? Because that is single thread. That has been optimized in the past years, but it still have too much work to be done in one single main thread. And let's say that that thread is totally uh, busy. I'm running a JavaScript code. My thread is busy, and I do need to perform something else, such as some layout change. I have to move an element from a place to another. My JavaScript is there running. Can I do that simultaneously? No, I can't, because that is not multiple threads, but just single threads. Let's say that my thread is fully busy performing HTML parsing, I cannot execute the JavaScript, or if it's too busy doing anything else. Let's say you have 1,000 tasks, one single thread is able to perform it, and that represents a very important bottleneck. Here I have a demo for your further understanding. That's a very silly full page with two HTML buttons one image with a GIF, so it's animated sound, and one chat box only. That's a native chat box, which does nothing at all. Zero JavaScript, CSS works here just to give us a blue background. That's it. I open that in my navigator with the right navigator console. The console it works to type what commands, what sort of commands, JavaScript commands. While I run JavaScript, something else happens while my page is running. If JavaScript was embedded in a JavaScript tag, it would be exactly the same. This is the GIF. The guy keeps running. There is a chat box. I take it, untake it, and there is a, f a feature. Regardless, I run once, twice, now a hundred times. Look at the GIF. A hundred times again. Look how fast the character goes. Now 500 fold. I'll try to click on the button. I clicked. Have you noticed? It's a very subtle change, but it happens. Click is just a register once the execution is done. Does that make sense? What can you tell me now? Main thread is competing to ex execute mo an additional task. So three things are in place in my JavaScript code. Animation, GIF animation, which has to run frame by frame, and user interaction. And the user interaction is not even JavaScript code. The thick box does nothing. That's a just a native component of the system. And even though I'm not able to click on it, 
while your animation is running, fair enough. Once I run JavaScript, that becomes a priority at the main thread. JavaScript blocks that down. And while your JavaScript is burning my CPU, nothing else will be executed. My clicks are interrupted. Anything, even if I try to scroll down the page, will not go down. If I try to, if I try to open any sort of menu, that will not be possible. If I want to escape to another page, forget it. Users' boot is not processed while the main thread is not free. That's quite annoying because we almost break down the browser with HTML and JavaScript lines only. And we go through that every single day. It may be that your features will not execute that as expected, and you may not notice it. If it runs quite fast, maybe it's interrupted, it's locked, but it, it's so fast that you do not even perceive it. Once I heard a very interesting saying by a speaker who said, any JavaScript line in your life has locked your browser sometime. So, be aware of what writing in your JavaScript. Your code may be longer or take longer than the regular one, but sometimes you write one single sentence and that uh, is locked for some nanoseconds. It was totally non-responded. So let's keep that in mind next time we run a JavaScript. In the web uh, under road, it is, it is said that if a user types an event in any electronic system, an app, anything, anything that requires input, there is a certain expectation by users to get a, an answer with less than 100 milliseconds. Users expect response in less than 100 milliseconds. <laughs> Double submit, what's that? You fill the form out, you click send once, and then you think, well, it didn't go through. Let me click again, then when you double submit, the form, why? Why do you do that? Because that form did not answer you fast enough. Our brain expects that if I do something, I will get an answer in 100 milliseconds. If I do not get such an answer, I think that something went wrong. So it is sad in the web scenario that nothing should take longer than 100 milliseconds to be processed. While I was running my JavaScript that would take seconds, I wouldn't see much from user's standpoint. And somehow I broke that magic matrix. Users, they have that negative experience when their needs are not met. Serge, what is the solution then? Well, that's the main thread. There is nothing else to be done. Those of you that are experts in competitors' technologies, you know that the JavaScript has no language commands for multi-thread commands. That is not a type of language that was created for this type of environment. I see Java, any other language. JavaScript relies on single thread environment. What to do? We have two solutions. Let's go deep in each one of them. First, if your problem is a very busy main thread and nothing else can be executed, a first option is instead of letting the main thread busy for too long, 
try to break it in smaller blocks. If I interrupt it little by little, right there in the middle, it will be possible to run something else. And that gives us a feeling that things are working fine. Well, that's not so trivial in web. Web is not a multi-thread environment, so it's not just a matter of uh, triggering a different thread. How can we make that smaller? Here, a same demo with the same chat box, but once I am ready to run that Ford 500, I'll try to break it down in small little pieces. And I will apply one of the oldest functions in the universe. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because that dates from the 90s. Have you heard about the seven timeout? You have a part of the code to be executed and run in the future, in some time in the future. I can use the set timeout to break those 500 executions in 500 pieces of, pieces of set timeout to be executed later on in the future. Code is not as important, but rather understanding the solution. Same case, and now I have a code. The main difference here is that it goes from 1 to 1,000, but with the set timeout, it, it is executed once, and it runs the set timeout. Take a look at the animation at the click. While it is running, the click and the animation works. Does that make any sense at all? By doing that, I avoid that 1,000 block of executions. It will block main thread for several seconds. And in order to avoid it, we break that in small pieces. And if I lock main thread for small pieces, within that interval, I'm able to run animation, users' clicks, and anything else. So avoid uh, huge code blocks which are responsible to block the main thread for too long. And the bottleneck, uh, that sounds quite easy to be understood and how to know exactly in future cases. I will tell you about that. And also, that takes much longer to be executed than the previous example. How come final time of code execution is low, it's smaller than the previous time? I schedule each one of the blocks to be conducted within 10,000, 10 milliseconds. So once one is executed, they wait and another 10 milliseconds. That time is enough for each one of the actions to be executed. And the time to execute the last code line will be greater. If you have any sort of urgency, you will not run that JavaScript because that's not f fast enough. It's quite rare. That's a rare case, you don't find longer times. But within that model, the solution is not good enough. It's better to block the main thread and run right afterwards. But in general lines, we want to prioritize the user's experience and not our code time experience. The idea is to allow interaction as if anything else was going on. You might be considering that that is working fine as I set 10 million seconds. No, no, I will set time out with zero. What is that exactly? It, I am scheduling that piece of code to run in the future, always in the future, whenever that's possible. Run that in the future. And if the future can be now, 
So shall we do that right now? Even if you schedule with a set timeout zero, man trades free than in that uh, one single block because it will always go to the last of the, of the queue, allowing other things to be executed. See yourself. Same code, enter, click. Sometimes it gets slower, but a disclaimer, please. I record here a GIF, and you know that GIF to be recorded is just horrible. The real experience in this page is even better than the one I'm showing you. GIF is much slower. This is a GIF of another GIF. This is a total chaos, just to make my talk easier. My box here is open and browser gets slower. That's not too bad. I click it, it runs. Animation is there running in the back. Sometimes it gets locked now and then, but it keeps running even with a set, with a zero set timeout, which still allows other things to be conducted in the middleware. Well, we have, if you have any questions, concerns, just interrupt me, please. I know that the room is quite dark. I don't want you to feel sleep. Can you follow me all right? Great. And then we have to see what it is that we can do. The idea is how you can split some codes into smaller blocks of code to allow an opportunity for them to do things in the middle and the site timeout is not the only way to do this. S and therefore I have included a list of things that will enable you to have smaller blocks of codes to be scheduled in the future. And if you don't use set timeout, you're going to use something else. So you're all familiar with set timeout, right? Uh, we have some other ones. And here we have site mediate. And this is like a cousin of site timeout. Who invented it was Microsoft. You have supported Edge, but unfortunately the other browsers didn't like it very much. It's really nice. And it's a sort of like a zero site timeout. And then the agenda is like the next thing to come up. And it's faster than the site timeout zero, because if you investigate the specifications, you know that even if you have zero site timeout, the navigator understands it that's being two or four. There is like a slash, you know, and if uh, it is site time zero, you just enter two. But this guy will say, okay, do it right away. But right away in the future, and this is important for us to understand because this is a very complicated concept. What is immediately now or what is immediately now in the future? And therefore, you get into a line and it will run as soon as possible. But if you have something else running, this other thing will run first. And this is what makes us have the feeling that things are going on at the same time, such as JavaScript and others. I'm telling you this little story, but in practice, it, it only works with Edge, and I don't know whether it's really interesting. And then uh, afterwards, you can Google it, uh, and we have some interesting opportunities. And uh, there's another case. Have you ever heard of this? It's a little bit more famous, better known. Are you familiar with the uh, request animation frame? I also have four hands. OK. Request animation frame has to do with animation. The idea is the same. You have a function, and the function is executed in the future. The idea is that it's going to synchronize this function with the comms that are given in the, sc in the screen. We call them frames. Now, you know how animation works. You get a block of paper. You draw a man with a leg on each one of the pages, and you move them really fast. So animation is in fact an illusion. You, what you have are several drawings, and when they go by fast, you have a feeling that there's some animation. So this is the same thing with the internet, the same principle. 
And so what this is telling me is the following. I want this animation to be executed in the next frame. And it sort of synchronizes the execution of that script function with the speed that you go by through the different pages in your notebook. And uh, if you're a gamer, you know that it's usually 64 frames per minute. Uh, so you know that a game, uh, or actually it's 64 frames per second. And you know that uh, you have good quality whenever you have 64 per second. And for you to have the best animation possible, you want to be able to run 64 frames per second. And if you divide one number by the other, you have seconds divided by 64. And each frame is executed in 16 milliseconds. And therefore, for each 16 milliseconds, they have a new frame. And why am I telling you this? Because it is almost as if request animation frame is a set timeout, 16. Does it make sense to you? So it synchronizes the execution of the function with the rate of frames that you are executing in your machine. And you don't even have to worry about the accounts and details. And the idea is a little bit more interesting than that. And they try to do it along with animation for each one of the frames so that the frame uh, is done properly. So if you have request animation frame, this is going to be executed in the future. And this is all for you to be able to schedule things in the future. And there's another one, a really nice one. This is a new one. It's called Request Idle Callback. The other one was invented by Microsoft. This one was invented by Google, and it works in Google Chrome. It's a little bit better now because Chrome has 70% of the market, and Edge has, uh, you know, at least for our own sake, for the user, it's nice. This last one has a little bit more of appeal. Fireflux was uh, implemented in it, and it, I think it's already done. If Google Chrome implements, it means that you have it available in Android, and Firefox implemented, and you lose the two. Uh, then you say, hey, uh, can I use all of these solutions that work at a global level? Well, if the browser does not have any su support, you use the set timeout. And therefore, it's really easy for you to have a fallback. So if you have a browser with a support like this, so you can use it. Otherwise, you use the other one. And then you ask, uh, what is it good for? Do you know what idle means? Does anybody know if you were to translate it into Portuguese? Uh, it's idle. It means that uh, it doesn't really, uh, it's no good, or it's not very useful. So I call this function whenever I have idle time. This is wonderful. It's awesome. And remember when I said that the main problem with my delivery is that I had a lot of things going on at the same time. And then you have a wonderful idea. You want to execute another one. And then the murmur is busy. And then you put in another one. And it's on your way because it was already busy. And it's going to be even busier. And eventually, you will have your own code that you want to execute, but the priority is not as high. And then if you know when you're free, then you say, OK, I cannot wait. And then when you're free, um, yeah, so when it's idle, you no longer have layout, no SS. You have concluded doing what you had to do. And this is what the callback does for you. It will look at you and say, hey, the browser is informing you. Weren't you waiting for a free moment? I'm telling you now that you have some opportunity here. And therefore, it is informing you that it is free and you can execute something. And now I'm going to show you a demo, which is really nice in my opinion. And this is something different. I used the same click. But then, on the bottom, I created something else. And it will work with uh, any kind of processing. But it's very important, because whenever I run this, it will have top priority. And this is a button. 
and you will see that it's consuming more things. And then in parallel to all of this, I will try to run a code with a lower priority. And because it has a low priority, I'm going to use this trick of, of request idle callback and say, OK, you're only going to run when it's free. And so you can see it. Everything is running very nicely. I'm going to use request idle callback. It's very similar to site timeout. And it even tells you how much idle time you have left. And so I'm only going to run if I have more than 30. So you're running, it is idle, and then all of a sudden I do something heavy. I click, and note what happens. Every time I click on something, you can see that it's no longer executing idle callback. You can see that it's locking the counter. Every time I do something, I either click here or there. So every time I do something more important than this idle thing, the idle will say, OK, I do not have free time right now. And so if you take into account the time that will be required to run this, you know, it's uh, hard. And the most important thing for you is to prioritize what the important codes are, the ones that are not, the secondary ones you put into an idle callback and those that are a priority you have to do. But the idea is that you can use different ways of scheduling so that in the end, you can release the main thread. The freer your main thread is, the better for the user it will be. And remember that magic number I told you where the user clicks on something, it wants it to be able to respond in 100 milliseconds. And so that's a magic number. And the only way for you to guarantee the user that whenever he uh, uh, clicks and then he will respond, you will never execute a code that will take Longer. If you have a code that takes one second, then it will click. It, it'll do it in the middle. So the only way for you to guarantee that your application is 100% responsive to the user click, meaning that at any time you're going to answer, it means that none of these blocks can have more than 100. And people in the market say that uh, the optimal time would be 50, because in addition to take at most 50, then you have some space to process the input of the users. Because it's no use for you to have 100 and 100, and you can't solve it. And so breaking it to, into blocks of 50 is usually an interesting idea. And that's very difficult to do in practice because it depends on the CPU and many other things. But the idea is for us to try to get as close as possible to this. I'm not telling you that everybody's going to do this. In the real world, things are a little bit more chaotic. But when you're familiar with the tools, you're able to decrease your problems, your bottlenecks, until one day, perhaps your page can be faster. So all of this has to do with breaking into smaller blocks. Do you have any questions so far? I have other things to execute in the main thread. And what if I don't use the main thread? What if I use something else? Well, only if I have a multi-thread, uh, uh, something that um, is not available. And perhaps one day we'll have it available. If we were watching this lecture on 2021, we'll be talking about other performance practice. But uh, it has been like this for a long time. And therefore, I would not expect it to change in the near future, even though people have been making a lot of good uh, um, progress. Um, Firefox will have something available for the end of the year, and they are promising to revolutionize everything. They have basically rewritten. They have the Firefox Quantum. Have you ever heard of it? You will hear of it in the near future because they're going to make a lot of noise with that. They have been launching small bits, and they are rewriting smaller parts of Firefox and re-implementing many of the things that people have been doing the same way for a long time. And they're promising a night performance. And so let's see 
what happens next year. But this is a browser of something which has not even been released yet. And so the other technique is avoid using the main thread. And we have some other interesting things. And whenever we talk about the web and JavaScript, whenever we think about multi-thread, the first word that should come to mind, and if you're familiar with it, OK. Uh, but the first uh, thing that comes to mind is web workers. Have you ever heard of it? Web workers is the way for you to do multi-thread in quotes in the web. Uh, this is something that started when HTML5 or Safari, iOS, whatever. It is supported in every navigator, so you know that you're not going to have any problems. And it enables you to have a multi-process architecture, as if you had multi-processes. It's not a multi-trend because you do not have a memory communication. You do not have any lock problems. And close parentheses, so if you've never studied it, it doesn't really matter, but you can do parallel things in the web. So how do I do that? Well, this is the same example again, and now my solution is going to be different. Instead of getting the 500 executions and breaking them in smaller blocks, I'm going to get the 500 heavy ones, and I'm going to put them in a parallel thread, like a web worker in that magical place you can run things in parallel with the main thread. For you to do that, I'm going to show you the case, the code. But first of all, it has to be in a separate file, and therefore I will have to put it in a separate file, and I'm going to show you in the stab. I have included up to 3,000. And then in the main thread, I do the new worker. And then I pass my JavaScript. Now see what happens. This guy is clicking. This guy is animating. So there are three things going on at the same time. Everything I wasn't able to do before, I can do now because I have removed it from the main thread and I have put it in a parallel thread. So I put it in a parallel worker. It's responsible for executing the codes because it runs at a different thread in a different CPU. And if I have more than one core, it's going to run in the other CPU. And therefore, I can do something in terms of parallel preparation in the web. So why do I say that this is not really a thread? Well, because for them, to implement it safely in the web, they had to have some limitations. And we know that the main problem with two threads is when you have shared data. So you have one memory space being used by two people at the same time. And that may lead to race conditions if you get there first, so you got it. But it has a lot of problems, such as lock, and I'm not going to talk about it now. But with other languages where you work with this, you know, you must have a huge control. With JavaScript, you don't have that. And so you cannot share memories between your main code and the code of the web worker. So what does it mean? It means that in web worker, you cannot do anything that involves a document, which is basically everything you do. And also, you cannot have a jQuery. You can't do anything that will manipulate the, the memory structure, which represents the different tags on the page. So if I have two tags working with the same memory structure, then you will have a thread problem. So to avoid that, he said, OK, that's not allowed. And that limits the use of Web Worker because you cannot treat events in there. You cannot jump inside because it involves DOM. Or you cannot manipulate things with jQuery and do things that usually are done by web applications. Web work is very useful for the processing of things that you want to leave in parallel and that do not demand a DOM. So uh, heavy functions and logic functions with which execute other things. I don't know whether you've ever heard of Bitcoin running web workers in people's machines. Uh, 
that's really fashionable. And people have discovered web worker is a good way for you to work with Bitcoin. And when you do that, you make some money for each visitor. People are really upset at this. And so the Bitcoin blocker will be the next blocker of advertisements. That's really easy to do. But anyways, uh, this is uh, uh, mining. This involves DOM. It's only very heavy processing in a web worker. It's a strong candidate for that. So even though it is a solution, it's a nice solution, but it has its own limitations. For those of you who would like to know more details, web workers only communicated with the main thread by communicating events as if you had like an event list and things that you're, this week you have one event from one side to the other and you can communicate them. But you should never share memories. With this, with this we more or less have a multi-thread and the web. So this is going to be the other solution. Does I-9 have uh, web worker support? If it doesn't, then the point here is that it's very use easy for you to have a fallback. You run a code with a parallel thread, and uh, the, or else you can run in the main thread. In fact, uh, it will be slower, but it will work. I know that the more recent ones have that. Was uh, that the 11? Yes, for 2017. You can exchange your job, you know? Quit your job. I have uh, had to provide maintenance in I6. So then, okay, you say, I got it. We have two strategies, break into blocks, and the other one is not to use the main thread. Okay, uh, this is really nice, but how do I find out that I have a bottleneck? And then you want to know if my application is going through that. So then you look and you say, okay, it's locking, but it's not locking so ridiculously. Animation runs. Sometimes it's better if it locks and then you know that it's locked instead of blocking it or very quickly, but it's important for you to demonstrate how you identify that or how you identify these bottlenecks and how they show up at the moment of debugging so that you can identify the correct solution. To do that, you're going to use another tab. It's called Performance tab. Have you ever used it? For those of you who have never used it, the first time you see it, it's, uh, uh, it, you know, you can, uh, you know, it's really difficult and you don't know what you have to do, but I will show you very quickly how you can read the output of this tab. But basically, it enables you to use a recording button, like a rec button, where you can record all of the events and everything that is done by the browser, everything that happens inside your internal browser for a certain period of time. And so the idea is to have your animation running. And then I force a problem, I record everything, and with that I can observe based on this log or on all of these recordings what the bottleneck is. This is more or less the idea, and I'm going to show it to you now. So here we have the same example, the Sonic. And then I push the rec button. Then I start recording. And I open, I run the first code, the one that was slow and would block everything. And then my click doesn't answer, and I do it only once. I stop, wait, and it's going to load a timeline. In this timeline, 
it is going to show over time what was executed in the browser. So here you have the main thread. And what is a main thread? What was executed here? Well, first of all, it has shown me that I have 3,000 milliseconds. And in yellow, I have JavaScript. Whenever you see the yellow there, you know that you have a Java, JavaScript. And so during this time, between this time, we had a JavaScript. In the meantime, I tried to have an input. I clicked the mouse down button close to 7. And it was only able to execute it at 9.5. So what does it mean? Can you see this? So my click was received by the navigator here, but it was only processed when the giant JavaScript was executed. So while my JavaScript was in the main thread, you can see the main thread here. So what is the main thread doing here? JavaScript. So while it was there, my input was not able to execute. And when the yellow one is over, then I can run my input. So for three seconds, my page did not respond. The user would click on and on and on, and nothing would happen. After JavaScript was released, was finished, then I could process all of the events. So I'm just illustrating an example we had already seen before. Does it make sense? So this is the first tip of the day for you to identify your bottlenecks every time you open your timeline. And you find a mega block in yellow here, you have a red sign. It is visual. It's easy. So you should be aware that for those five seconds, your page has not done anything other than executing that uh, JavaScript. So you do your debugging. And then you use one of the strategies we saw before. In the next one, and this is the same site timeout. Remember the first one? It's going to break into smaller blocks. And how do we see this in the timeline? Once again, the same example. You have a recording here. I'm running. I'm going to run the seven timeout. I click. I continue running. And then I stop. It's going to be uploaded. And then you see it on the top here. Can you see the yellow one? You say, wow, Sergi, you now have the yellow block again. Now, what do you see here? It's still taking three seconds. The difference is that in the middle, I have four idle seconds. I give a zoom for you to see. And what can you see here? What seemed to me a giant yellow block, in fact, is several smaller yellow blocks. And then in the middle, we have some green ones, which means the animation is being executed. When I see my input, you can see that it's done almost instantly, because it finds a spot here in the middle, because I've broken it into smaller blocks. And then I give an opportunity for other things to come in the middle. Can you visually see what we had talked about before? So I will have more free time. Uh, he said, well, if I have an animation, isn't it going to be broken? Well, it's always broken. What we have are different frames that are renderized at a constant pace. So it is going to be broken, but the trick is for you to do it in a pace of 64 per second. So if you can design each frame according to the right pace, you will have an animation. And in fact, you only design a frame and then break. 
but it runs smoothly. See this green bar on the top? Here on the corner, it says that it is an FPS counter. It counts the frames per second. The higher the bar, the more frames per second I will have, and the lower, the less frames I will have. So all of this here on the top means we have 64 frames per second. This is the real world. In the real world, things are not so perfect. They depend on the hardware. And sometimes they go down. For instance, here we have run at 64 per second for a small or a short period of time. And you have to keep in mind that it's not only your code that is running. You have the browser code, you have operational codes, you have many codes. And even if you optimize them, something became slower and has delayed your renderization. As far as possible, you should do everything you can to run at 64 frames per second. In the previous one, we had a giant valley here, and the counter was zeroed. So we had 60, 60, 60, and zeroed. 60, 60, 60. So while yellow was being executed, it wasn't able to run a single animation frame, and then the animation will eventually block. Are you following? OK. And the last one, so you understand how to debug it. What about web work? What's that? When you throw that in a parallel thread somewhere that does not make the main thread busy. Same example. But here I release a work. Click, animate it. That's a very bad GIF. I stop it. There is a great difference in relation to the previous one. Take a look at the yellow piece. How about that? That is a way to show you that your man thread has nothing in yellow. Dedicated worker thread. Over here, there are four seconds of JavaScript, a giant yellow block. But as that is outside the main thread, that does not lock my PFS, my inputs, nothing at all. That's exactly what we saw before, but now you are able to identify it in your navigator. Does that make sense? When you use the web work, you can clearly see that that gets out of the main thread. What is cool, this is the holy grain, a wild main thread. Anytime when you do anything, I can answer instantaneously. The main thread is free. What you want to do is to maximize the main thread. Does that make sense? I was going to go on a trip, and then I decided to show that on a real website. I was taking a look at Airbnb. Oh my God, that is being recorded. The Airbnb guys will <laughs> listen to me. So I got the Airbnb website that's famous. I had identified some bottlenecks there. From this performance standpoint, there is a severe problem that is highly dependent on JavaScript. Why you do not execute the angle, the React? Uh, 
that runs in the main thread, and it locks all the rest. And you have to really trust that Facebook did what it should be done. And that's not all. Your user should not be in a more limited CPU and so on. Then I opened the Airbnb website. I was in my cell phone. Well, cell phone is worse than a MacBook, right? And in the cell phone, it gets even slower. What have I done? CPU throttling. I'd say that my cell phone is twice as slower than my computer, even more than that. Then I ask them to upload the page. I am reloading the page. So I want to show in a complex site how to find out that you have a problem. Here, when you see yellow, zero seconds up to 15 seconds, the page is totally locked. So it's useless to design in five seconds. I design something. What happens? Nothing. I go on with the mouse, and I can see that the frame took four seconds to run. Four thousand, two and a half. If I had any animation, too bad. JavaScript, 700 milliseconds. So I have three or four giant JavaScripts that block everything. This is a service worker. Is that a criticism? No, it's a way to try to show you how to identify such a bottleneck in the website. That is, is irresponsiveness. There are some drops. Ideally, we should not have those blocks of several seconds. Another example here, code covers. Out of all assets and JavaScript, CSS, and so on, how much has that been used? I got a JavaScript here with 700 kbytes, and I didn't use anything at all. That was executed there at the main thread, but didn't work for much. One meg of JavaScript. He is no longer used 40 percent, 66. So this is not to point to him, but to those uh, single application. It's very easy to use the whole application in JavaScript. And then you overload the main thread, the download. And maybe here I'm executing JavaScript that we will only be seeing afterwards. So they are delaying the initial user experience considering the future. The future will not have to download that again. Each JavaScript that I do, it occupies the main thread, even if that is not applied in the current screen. Does anyone develop single page applications here? 
maybe react, uh, pre-art, backbone, amber, you name it. The f framework was responsible for that. Some techniques to be applied. Here, just a note by the, for those who work with PA. TTI, time to interactive. This is a metric that Chrome has. For how long is my page interactive? When do I release the main thread? While your main thread is busy, my page is not interactive. It may be there, but users can't do much. They can just read and nothing else. How long does it take for my page to become interactive and how to do that with single page when you become a framework a refugee? Server side rendering, anyone? Instead of uh, run that in the regular application, run them in the back end. And then you release a HTML renderized view. When you have one mega JavaScript, if you add up, you'd have one million mega, and that's a serious problem. People, they overuse codes, so mitigates the number of codes. Any JavaScript that you had run, they had locked your browsers somehow. So do not just import a new lib just because you want to apply a certain feature, as that is responsible for locking your system. Those of you who do not, those who work with SPA, take a look at code splitting. Instead of downloading the whole JavaScript and the first res, uh, request, you just download it for roaming. If that navigates to an intermediate page, then you can download the rest of it. That is the so-called code splitting. If you break that in smaller files to be downloaded on demand, SPA reinvents things that we had before. So you have to think that over. What's tree shaking? You may import several libraries. And in SPA world, that's quite common. React, you import a number of dependencies. And sometimes you even use a part of that dependence. But at building time, the whole framework is uploading. And tree shaking means literally what the name says. You import a number of framework, but then you shake and see those that have no call, you just get rid of. Let's make sure that you are not importing unnecessary things. Head ahead of time a compiler. You can do that before submitting things for production. Like uh, JX, they compile that in your device and not uh, under production. Avoiding executing several things and the browsers. So do not get desperate, just research for it. If you use a certain framework, that does not necessarily mean that you cannot control the code. No, you may optimize those with different techniques. And the goal is decreasing main thread occupation. 
Some are even ex considering exploring the web worker. Angular process are taken to web worker. That is still under experiments, but maybe by next year it will be able to execute frameworks. The framework does that transparently. Prioritize it. The more you take from main threads, the better. Unfortunately, the classic SPA standards, they do not run web worker. Angular and the main threads and so on and so forth. When we talk about both the practices to release the main thread, first one is to split that in a smaller, uh, uh, to split it in a smaller slices and then to use the web worker. But let me add, there is a different way to take work from main thread and to take it in a different one and throw it in a different one, which is not web worker. What's GPU? GPU is the graphic design plate in your computer. Any computer has a CPU and a GPU. Gamers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes they spend more than a computer price just to buy a GPU and be able to run games in a multiplayer for controls and so on and so forth. GPU is responsible for graphic design acceleration. Whole web would run in the CPU, and that's it. But we can take some of them. They have to do with graphics, animation. Take that from main thread and throw that in the GPU. Our Sonic's back. But Sonic now has a different type of animation. Instead of an animated GIF, that is a static image. I will animate it with CSS animation, like transition and things like that. My animation is no longer a GIF which will take the sonic and throw it one side to another and try to increase and decrease its size. Take a look. Sonic increasing, decreasing. This is CSS running a CSS. I will execute my slow CSS. I will read that through, and that will be a bit different than before. Before getting the JavaScript, we have uh, green and purple stuff. Main thread is busy not only with JavaScript, but also with purples and greens, the so-called Comp and layout, and yellow represents JavaScript. I had uh, several pain, Pantheon layout, but with JavaScript, just stop it. Paint layout, layout is uh, purple and paint green. Any time I change a characteristics, I have to recalculate it. That's a hell. Sometimes you change one pix and it changes it all. 
Sometimes we have 300. Then if we go to 301, oh my. CSS is cool, but there is a strong interdependence between them. Sometimes you change something in the CSS and browser is not able to know in advance what are negative results. There is a change in pixels. Let's recalculate the whole thing because it may be that one pixel has changed the whole thing. So we have to recalculate it as a layout when you change a style that has a potential to be responsible for a layout change. That's a pixel that has been changed. And then you have to redesign what has been moved. So you change it, repaint the screen, paint. And my animation, purple means layout, green, paint. And for any reason, that animation takes brow turns browser totally out of its mind. It's totally crazy. Purple, purple, purple. Two lines of CSS. A silly page, recalculating layout one after the other. And that layout keeps changing as Sonic also changes. Chrome today does layout and paint everything at the main thread. That means that once my JavaScript runs, I cannot perform layout paint. Therefore, my animation is not calculated, designed, nor executed. We have too many things fighting in the main thread. In addition to JavaScript, uh, Paint, uh, HTML, we have some layout operations that take place in some sort of animations. What about solutions? What is supposed to be an optimized or non-optimized solution? Here, record, I run JavaScript. JavaScript does not lock animation, so they are not competing. I will stop it, and you see the difference there. Or maybe not. Loading, just a second. Processing, what's the difference? main thread. What about green? What about purple? It's gone. GPU down there. I still have a block of JavaScript, which represents a problem. But my big block of JavaScript, it blocks the main thread which is not a problem. My animation is running in the GPU as if it was a separated thread. My animation not, does not depend on main thread. Does that make any sense at all? What's my goal? I show you a problem, and we attack that problem from different sides. First, avoid yellow chunk. And moreover, let's say that you are not able to avoid it. What to do next? Remove black, uh, purple and green from main thread and throw that somewhere else. You are able to remove a main thread to run in the GPU 
and avoid heavy JavaScript. My goal then is to show, is to see, I mean to show GPU in use. Ele perguntou se o, o vídeo, às vezes em background, às vezes ele fica travado, às vezes não. É, precisaria analisar exatamente o caso para saber, né? É, mas para o vídeo ficar performático, claro, ele vai tentar jogar. And for a video to reach a high performance, that will be sent to GPU as much as possible. I'm not an expert in video, so I don't know how easy that is. If you find a bottleneck like that, just release a performance via. When you are a young kid and you are learning HTML, what do they do? You open your favorite website and then you just give a source, resource. HTML, a ah, view source, I'm sorry, view source. How do you learn about performance? Well, you analyze the website performance. If you find a bottleneck, just stop it all, open performance, and then you'll be able to learn how to read it in real websites. What about throwing that in the GPU? Don't you think that we'll be relying too much on the user's computers, the user's machine? I mean, I'm talking about a user that hasn't got a very strong video plate or plate. In fact, the pendants were similar. You do not know how good their CPU is as you are not able to anticipate it you understand that just the fact of stopping it is better even if they have a bad cpu ideally that will be improved but for sure that fully depends on each one's devices Even a cell phone that you buy, a very you know cheap one, it comes with a GPU. That would be better, but still you have to measure it, okay? CSS. First line, example number one. Second line, example number two. CSS animations. It's just animation. As simple as that. First one has animation of the left uh, property that improves in size and it decreases. I did that in a very weak way. And then I exchange left for a transformer, translate and edit by a scale. I estimate the original one and the new one, and I learned that it increases in 70%. But I'm just changing animation for the transformer operation. That's a very famous image as how browsers work. I was, I'm not very skilled to d draw it, but anyhow, that's the PEX pipeline. What happens, what is a flow, execution, what to do to draw a pixel on the screen, and that has to be done at each frame of uh, animation. By animating, I mean to design a new frame every 16 milliseconds. What to do? If my animation requires JavaScript, I'll have to run that. 
jQuery is an animation via JavaScript. If, if I am dealing with a CSS animation, that is a step to be skipped. To animate means to move something on the screen. There is no animation that keeps same style. You either move someone to the right, to the left, you increase, you, do, you decrease, you change the dimensions, you change some sort of style. And this is exactly the style phase. That's exactly the step by step mentioned before. Different style browsers panic immediately. CSS, if you change here, you break it all. So please recalculate the whole layout. That has a potential to recalculate the layout of the whole page. If I change one small edit of one element, I have to stop and recalculate if all others will not be affected. This is the layout phase. Then I identified that there was this layout change. What to do, ne what to do next? I paint any sort of changes. You design, you design, you draw pixel by pixel, and you change colors. You paint one by one. And what am I adding to it? How about modern browsers? Firefox is even trying to change some of those aspects in their new release. They design uh, screen elements. So each one of these elements has its own layout, its own style, and uh, they're going to transform that into pixels. Mm -hmm. And they do that in length. So how does it work? If I have different elements in my menu on the top, I design the header in one layer as if it were a Photoshop, and then the menu in another layer have different elements, there are some rules involved, but of course it's not one layer for each element, otherwise it'll drive you nuts. And it designs everything into layers and this stage, this composite layer means that you're going to get every layer I had before and I will uh, put them together and therefore I can visualize it in my page. The menu has to come on top of the page. So in this uh, stage, you're going to use the previous layers. Everything is going to be put on the screens. And so you ask me, Sergio, why do you talk about composite so much? Well, because this is where we have the most uh, difficult thing. Everything is done in the main thread. Composite is done in the GPU, and so what is your trick? What are you going to do from now on? You have to avoid as far as possible to do things in the main thread, and then put as many things as possible in the composite. The GPU is very simple. It doesn't do a lot of things. I don't know whether any of you here develop games or if you have uh, design anything for the GPU, but the GPU does not allow you to run Ajax. It doesn't do that. It works with graphs. The most it, it can do is get the layers that were previously designed, put them together, and as uh, that is done, they can do smaller things, such as, for instance, displacing one layer from one side to the other or turning one al uh, around. That's the most it can do. It does not redesign, execute codes, but some effects may be used, some very simple effects, which are GPU effects. And what I wanted to show you in this next slide is going to be our objective. We have to avoid layout. We have to avoid the purple one. And uh, and then in the second example, we had the green and purple, and therefore I removed the layout. But I allowed the GPU to execute thing, and I put everything in the composite or in the GPU. So how do you do that in the practice? This is the bad news. 
in today's browsers and perhaps in 2021, this lecture is going to be reviewed. In 2017, almost going on 2018, we only have two properties in CSS that are purely composite, purely GPU, which are accelerated in the GPU. Transform and opacity. that's all. Well, Sergio, but I wanted to have a with it. Well, it's not going to happen, at least in the GPU. Oh, Sergio, but I wanted to work with the top. You know, top is something we go down. Well, so well, the top is not in our whitelist. The top is not animated in the GPU. Well, but I would love to have a color background animation, like, you know, with different shades of color, going from yellow to blue. But that's not done in the GPU. It's one of the worst things you can have. Because for each color, you know how it works, for each intermediate color, it re reprints the page again. And if you do that for the whole page, then basically you're invalidating it uh, for each one of the frames. But that's why uh, in the previous code, I had exchange left and with it for a transformer, and then with that, I reached my objective, which was to put in the GPU. Does it make sense for you? So then I get an example, a simple example. I work at Allure, I told you in the beginning, online courses, and this is our website. There was one effect the designer asked us to implement, and it was a performance bottleneck, and we had to consider it a little bit. On the top, we had a search tool, and then this, uh, he said, okay, he says you click there and search, but I want it to be animated. I wanted it to go down. It looks simple, it's easy for a designer to say, do that, it is more difficult for you to do it, right? And so you can see here the details, and uh, you go to back to the top, and the search box will push the whole site. So you do one thing there, and it will affect the layout of the whole page. And therefore, I have to slowly move the site for one second, and so I click it, and I move it to the bottom, and, and that's a whole website and everything is animated. It looks easy to do. I have recorded a GIF here. You can see what the animation looks like. It's a little bit locked, but the implementation is simple. I have designed it outside the screen. Uh, and you know, this is basic CSS. And then when I click on the symbol, on the search symbol here, what the class does is very silly. It displaces from zero to 100, and therefore the bar has 100, and then it's outside of the screen, and then when you search, it dislocates the whole site at 100 pixels, and then the bar becomes visible. Does it make sense? So there you have it there, uh, and then I place it in the container. It contains the whole site, but these are just details. The fact is, I have to be able to put it there, and then I have a transition, an animated transition. Well, but you have just said that the top doesn't work well. I'm going to record it in the timeline, and I'm going to show you something new. First of all, you see a lot of purple and green and here, I'm not even competing with JavaScript. I have so much green and purple that it takes my frames 100 to 120 milliseconds. And you can see the main thread is full of frames. You can see the purple ones, layout. So all of these uh, green uh, things here are frames. And I will show you, and this has to do with the com. I'm going to show you another Chrome resource. You say, you click on paint flashing. 
and then it paints everything green because it is showing me that that animation frame by frame invalidates the layout for each one of those boxes and so I will be redesigning it until the animation is over and that consumes the main thread and then you add a JavaScript and then you have a recipe for disaster. But you've already seen the solution. The solution was simple, basically, at least uh, simple to say and harder to do. You ha you so I'm going to exchange this for a transformer. And fortunately, the animation is simple enough for me to be able to do it. I got an easy case to translate. And then I make the exchange. I use transition, but more important than the code is for you to identify the bottleneck and find a solution. So this is uh, the, this performance tab is the most important thing. Is it the same? So I'm going to do the event once, and then I will press stop. And you can see a lot less green, a lot less purple, and so I'm going to look for where the event was. So I clicked right here, and you will see that I spent a lot less time with paint. I still have a green and a purple, but you can see that everything is much smaller than before. It's in the order of a millisecond. And then the GPU is a little bit fuller. The GPU has more things, and therefore, I am executing the animation in the GPU. I click Paint Flash, and I click here. Then you have a large green one in the beginning and another one in the end. You can see that it's different from the previous one. It is telling me that it only has to execute these tags in the beginning and in the end of the animation. The most critical thing is during animation, because then I have to maintain 64 seconds, or 64 per second. And, and before, I wasn't able to do this, and now I can, with a simple change. Once again, this change is the easiest part. What I want you to learn is how the browser renderizes, how you can identify the problem, and why this change is the solution. You cannot, I don't want you to uh, get out of here without learning how this browser works. We have a bottleneck here. I'm going to give a zoom, and you will be able to see it clearer. Here in this yellow part is where I make my click when I trigger my animation. There's a lot of green and purple, which are apparently inoffensive. harmless. So I give a zoom here, and then you will see that we have the click event. Then I have a large purple and a large green one. And then I no longer have any greens. But I have one large green one. And if you look closely, you see that they're all running at 17, 14, 16 milliseconds. But the first and second one have taken 34 and 27. The beginning of the animation is slow, but much better than before. Can you identify that the first two frames were not at 60 frames per second? And then, after it warms up, it was very smooth, but in the beginning it was kind of slow. It's important for you to understand what's going on. What's happening here? When I have a transform animation, it knows that this animation must be performed in the GPU. The role of the GPU is to get different layers and design them on top of the other. Put together different layers. The layer was previously designed, and they're put together. But they can only perform this task if you have layers in the GPU. If the layers have not been designed yet, the layers should be designed first, and then composite will 
play its role. If you do not tell anything to the ne browser, the navigator, the, I'm sorry, the browser won't know that you want to trigger an animation. The browser will say, well, uh, for me, this is just a page, a simple page. Everything is put into one single layer. That's done. But the problem with a single layer is that the GPU can only animate things in different layers, as I mentioned before, and therefore the browser must have these layers pre-prepared so that the animation can be run. So what happens? I'm clicking the yellow one. When I do that, I say, okay, I want to animate. Then the browser will say, uh-oh, you want to animate? I didn't know that. I have to have some layers before, and then afterwards I'll be able to have an animation. So the paint is the browser caught by surprise because the browser didn't know that these layers should have been pre-prepared. Does it make sense? You will say, okay, Sergio, this is very complicated, but it's not. So there's a new property called will change. If you're to translate it, what does it mean? Uh, it means that I'm going to change. So what do you say? It only knows that you're going to change, transform it when the search is visible. Before that, I will say, browser, pay attention, because at some point in time, I will transform the transformer. I will change the transform, OK? So I'm going to have it ready in the GPU. And then when you train to the transformer, you can go directly to composite and move on. Do you get the idea? Do you get what is behind this logic? The modern ones, everybody can understand, but then we have some issues. A web evolved like this. We have to survive. So uh, if I do it, what happens if the browser does not support it? Well, nothing will happen. Every CCS property that is not supported by the browser, then it will move on. The modern browsers will interpret that. Browsers, uh, when I say modern, it doesn't mean last week. We can use uh, browsers that are in a folder. So. In the past, for the sake of curiosity, I would like to know if you have ever seen this adaptation. You would have a transformer with a translate plus zero, which means it does nothing. But this would more or less invite the GPU, so will change is the specification for this adaptation. People will do it so often that they change its name to will change. I'm using the microphone, and therefore it's not possible to translate the question. He asked if this is going to work when another property changed, such as we did which is transform and op -ed. So the browser will create it, but it's probably going to be even worse because it's going to create it in the GPU, hoping that it will work with the GPU, and then when time comes, you try to do it, and you realize you have wasted time. So if we think of it, it's probably not a good idea. But let's imagine that in a future browser, more properties will be animated in the GPU, and it will help us with this scenario. Actually, the promise of this new Firefox, which is going to be released next year, is that they want to have more things in the GPU, and this is the most significant revolution we've had in animations. They have promised it, but uh, so far it isn't ready. So I have included this property. I have shown you the effects of before and after. And I don't have a video. I only have a screenshot. In the past, I had a giant paint. And then I would have composite and others. 
Now, after will change, I have the click event and no paint. Actually, the first frame is 16 milliseconds, and the green one is composite, meaning that I have been able to do what I wanted to. And then it will say, OK, Sergio, I have learned it. I will get out of here and be able to do it. All I have to do is to go to my CCS. Star will change off. Is that it? What is your opinion about that? Yeah. But in the worst scenario, will change, will generate a new layer in the GPU. You don't want to have one layer for each tag, I guarantee. You will crash the memory. But this is an optimization that we have to use very carefully. Some people would even tell you that you should not uh, do that with your C CS. So when they rubber with a button, I apply a change. And before the event is triggered, I use will change. And then it prepares. When I click, I use will change again. And then when it's over, I already remove it. And therefore, I have to be able to manage it. And now you can imagine a more complex page with different animations going on. You cannot use will change for all of that. You can, you can say, OK, put will change here and there. I don't know if I'm asking for too much, but I have a slideshow and I have been able or have been using transform I, to displace from right to left or the other way around. And then placing will change in there. Do you think that it would be too much? No, I think you can do that. I won't be putting in very heavy pictures, just more text. And the slide runs well when the page starts. Well, actually, it's not going to make a lot of difference. Uh, I'm having problems because of JavaScript. Yeah. I have broken it into pieces. But when you upload the site, you have, or you need to have two or three seconds before you can go in. And it makes me feel like it's been two hours because I'm a very anxious person. Well, my tip is for you to evaluate this very carefully. When you have a very long paint stamp, this is a problem. So you have to inspect before and after. And sometimes the bottleneck is something else. And so if this is the case, that's not a problem. I will try that. Well, in that case, you said that in the website, uh, you used animation that was not very significant. Another example that uses a lot of animation is Fanarlax. So I can see in the Fanarlax website that it runs smoothly. Some others will uh, lock. This, and the scroll is even worse. So it's probably using the GPU a lot. Well, Parallax has a lot of problems. Yes, it looks like it's printing. It is uh, really slow. Well, Parallax has two characteristics. First of all, it's an animation. You should try to put it as much as possible in the GPU. Number two, it should be related to scroll, which will run in the main thread whether you want it or not. So even if you put it in the GPU, the bottleneck is not the animation, but the scroll. You must enter an event there. So you have to pay attention so that you can do parallax in a proper way. You have to optimize the animation and put it in the GPU. And I wanted to show you two animations in the menu from left to right. This is easy to do with transform. Sometimes we have these simple animations, but we also have more complex animation, which will demand some more thought. If we had another hour, I would show you some more complex mm -hmm. cases, but I think you're tired now. 
if you allow me, I will speak the whole day. Uh, now, can you imagine what happened to me when they only gave me 40 minutes? I quickly needed more time than that. The case would be for you to look at your JavaScript and check whether you have any bottlenecks. I don't know whether you have used a scroll event with that, but if you do it, it will trigger after each pixel. And what is the problem here? Sometimes the JavaScript event will trigger even faster than those 64 frames per second. And then if your scroll event uses a complex code, parallax demands a lot of calculations, it will be doing this the whole time and then it will have a bottleneck. So the trick is to avoid having the scroll as a bottleneck for your application. You can also use the scroll throttle technique. Avoid having the scroll to trigger every minute. And with that, theoretically, you get close to an optimal performance. All times parallax were really like hell. Here, there is a, another example. Hover uploads. You just translate that. That's quite not complicated at all. Some homework. Once I gave this exact example in one of my talks. That's a quite complicated code. I have no time to show that right now. But it, you know, see that as a homework. How to solve that? There is a list of things. I click and I want to remove a card of the list and upload all others. That's not immediate. When you remove something, You have to get first position, second dynamic transform. It's kind of crazy. Two columns here. If you manage doing that, you are really skilled in animation, same code. I want you to try doing that with Transformer, where you remove one, and then you have a transformer of each element to a new place. That's not so complicated as it may seem. This is a It's back. How to unlock all of that performance uh, beyond max of renderization, animation, and so on. Thank you.